Hi, this is John Laird, and I'm going to talk about the SOAR Cognitive Architecture today and also how we have been doing open source research with it. I want to start off talking about the structure of complex AI systems. At the highest level, we can think of a task we're trying to achieve that we expect is not going to be sort of a trivial task, but something like um, an automated tutor. Um, in order to do that, we expect that we're going to be using lots of different aspects of AI. So what we call cognitive capabilities, things like planning, um, having a theory of mind of what the uh, student is, some meta reasoning about their, the student's reasoning, some problem solving and language processing. Each one of these, then, we can think about decomposing into sort of lower level algorithms in AI and also then low level data structures. So if we look at multiple tasks, we'll, such as automated driving, medical applications, and so on, we see that we're going to have a lot of different cognitive capabilities and we're going to have a lot of different low level algorithms and, and then underlying data structures. One way to go after this problem is to think about the cognitive architecture approach. Here, what we're trying to do is figure out what the class of low-level algorithms and data structures are that are shared across all these different kinds of cognitive capabilities, and then have a single system that supports all of them. So once we have that, we can support the cognitive capabilities, and then we can do the applications. Now, another approach, which is also sort of popular, I think, in some of the robotics work is to start with the cognitive capabilities and create separate independent systems that do these different kinds of things. So you might have a planner, you might have a natural language system, you might have a meta reasoning system. Our view is that the way to look at it is at this lower level and that each of these then is maybe implemented within something that's going on at the lower level. And that's our approach, it's not necessarily the right approach for other people that might be wanting to do it at that higher level, but that's the approach we're going to go after. And so this is the cognitive architecture hypothesis, and tries, which tries to answer how is sensing, action, reasoning, and learning all integrated into an autonomous agent. And the hypothesis is that complex cognition arises from a combination of a, six, a fixed set of computational building blocks, that's going to be a set of memories, processes, representations, and learning mechanisms. And then on top of that is going to be the learn language, I'm sorry, the knowledge, which is either innate or learned from experience. And that's often going to be programmed by a human, or hopefully a lot of it's going to be learned. But that's what's going to provide the different cognitive capabilities and then be able to support the tasks. So the ideas behind this come from Alan Newell and John Anderson, uh, both cognitive scientists. Um, John Anderson has popularized the ACT-R uh, architecture, and Alan Newell, uh, together with me and Paul Rosenblum, developed the SOAR cognitive architecture. So that's what I'm going to be talking about more today is the SOAR cognitive architecture. Uh, it was developed as part of my thesis um, back in the early 80s with Paul Rosenblum and Alan Newell. Um, the most recent and best reference for SOAR is the SOAR Cognitive Architecture book that I'm the author of, and that came out in 2012 and is available by MIT Press. Now, there's some aspects of the book that are no longer um, quite up to date, but it really is the best way to learn about SOAR. Um, this was in an earlier time. So, let's uh, talk a little bit about what the goals of the SOAR architecture was when we started it. What we wanted was to be able to support the development of multi-method, meaning not just use one problem-solving method, but many different kinds of problem-solving methods, be something that can be used for many different tasks, and tasks that had many different kinds of subtasks, and that also could support systems that were knowledge lean, meaning they didn't have a lot of expertise about a domain, and they might end up having to do a lot of search, but also knowledge-rich agents, so that if there was knowledge available, there was not have to be a lot of search and the system was able to reason directly and make decisions very quickly. And also these would be systems that interact with the real world. So our inspiration comes both from psychology and computer science. 
uh, from psychology. We really do look at how humans solve problems, how humans reason about the world, how humans interact with the world. And that is leads to a lot of the mechanisms. And there's even inspiration from neuroscience in terms of how the brain is structured. We also look to computer science and AI for efficient and robust implementation. So um, our goal is not to do a low level modeling of human behaviors, um, at, specifically at the neural level. Some of our work does involve modeling human behavior, say at the 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds level. And so we've done work in that area. And a lot of that is inspired by work that has been done in ACTAR. So there's a lot of overlap between uh, the kinds of mechanisms we use from the psychology side and systems like ACTAR. But what distinguishes SOAR is that we've tried to build systems that scale up to large tasks. And that um, is what we see here, and that we try to focus on complex behavior, building large systems, and that are going to exist in the world for longer time scales. So these are systems that have both high level and low level cognitive capabilities in terms of Kahneman's different systems level. SOAR supports both system one reasoning, which is very fast, um, is using uh, sort of a lot of implicit representations, but also system two, which involves more uh, deliberate reasoning, uh, planning, metacognition. We also um, support many different kinds of learning, uh, not just a single learning mechanism, uh, um, such as reinforcement learning, but um, also episodic learning, semantic learning, and procedural learning. And finally, the goal is to have systems that are very efficient in execution and scale to very large knowledge bases. So these are systems that can be real time in robotic applications or other kinds of um, embedded simulated worlds and that um, they can both be programmed with lots of knowledge or they can uh, learn a lot of knowledge over time. So a short history of SOAR, uh, we start back in the 1980s where we look at the desired capabilities we had in, in the system. As I mentioned, we started off with wanting multiple tasks and multiple methods. We then wanted to add in different general learning mechanisms, interacting with the environment, and being able to support large, knowledge-rich behaviors. And we've added in task learning, more human collaborative capabilities, and what we'll talk about in a little bit is comprehensive task learning. Um, in terms of the underlying mechanisms, we started out with a symbolic system that was based on problem spaces and rule-based systems. We've also then added different mechanisms over the time, over time. In the, in the mid 2000s, we added a lot of different um, memories and learning mechanisms, specifically reinforcement learning, episodic memory, semantic memory, mental imagery, emotion components. And we've also then developed um, a new implementation of, of the chunking mechanism. In terms of major applications, we started with toy problems. We then did some internal uh, reasoning problem, which was the R1 configuration problem. And then we started to do robotics. Um, as you can see, we've done a lot with robotics over the years um, with autonomous vehicles, but we've also done synthetic characters. And as I mentioned, we did cognitive modeling and being doing natural language understanding. So we try to do the whole gamut of different kinds of AI applications. This is the basic structure of the current version of SOAR, SOAR 9. Um, this was an extension which did add um, some new memories and learning mechanisms. Um, if you see, it's sort of central to the system is the symbolic working memory that holds the system's current goals, um, the current state of the world. Uh, it also, in order to feed into that, we have information coming in from perception, but an important component of that is the spatial visual system. This takes the vision in, but then creates a scene graph representation which is both object-based but also spatially based so that um, it has metric information. And from that, we can extract relations such as on top of, next to, uh, to the right of, that are then symbolic representations that the system can reason over. Having that kind of information in the working memory would be very expensive to match against. So that is a reason why we uh, move um, this out to a spatial visual system and then do their reasoning symbolically. From there, we have three different long-term memories. The procedural memory, which is rule-based, which is actually what controls the reasoning in the system. 
So it gives us context-dependent reasoning, but it also supports things like planning and meta-reasoning. We have semantic memory, which, control, which contains uh, all the long-term factual knowledge that the system has, and then episodic memory, which is um, a continual trace of the system's reasoning over time. And associated with all these learning, I mean, these memory systems, we have learning mechanisms. Finally, that we have action system that can go out to the world. I'm now gonna go through a simple example that is not reflective of what the system can do for robotic applications, but it gives you an idea for a human as to some of the kinds of reasoning SOAR can do. So we're gonna start out and I'm gonna just verbally ask you to do some reasoning and then we'll go and sort of look at what that would be in SOAR. So I want you to imagine the word wow. Now I want you to flip it upside down and then I want you to think of the last time you saw the spouse of that person. So that would be maybe the last time you saw your father and maybe that's never, but maybe that's um, been very recent or maybe it was a while ago if your uh, father passed away. But the point is you're using all these different components and it was effortless hopefully for you. And it didn't seem like you were suddenly switching between them, but that's what we would rec well, that's what we would model in terms of that. So if we go through how that would happen in SOAR, we get audio perception of imagining a word wow. We then uh, have to go into semantic memory in order to translate that into symbol structures. And then once we have that, that's going to be used to access procedural knowledge that actually will um, cause that, that to be imagined. So we have some skill about how to do imagination and that then is imagined in the visual buffer. We then say rotate and that's maybe nobody's ever asked you to rotate something in your visual memory before, but that would come in, go to uh, symbol rotate, um, and then that would have to go into procedural knowledge as to how that would be performed. And then we would rotate that and then this is where things get a little interesting, I think, is that we have this representation here that is a non-symbolic representation. These are the actual characters and we have to re-parse um, um, it. So we originally parsed wow coming in through an audio channel and then making contact with our semantic information. Now we're parsing mom coming through an internal, I would claim, visual representation. And then we're gonna make contact to that, to the symbol mom and that's some symbol, but then we say, uh, look up the, you know, what, uh, say something about a spouse. That's gonna have to go into semantic memory as to who's the spouse of mom. That would be your father. And then uh, th that would be something we then go and search an episodic memory for. When have we seen that person? And we might get some episode here, it's E555 that we then retrieve. And that has associated last Sunday and so then we would say Sunday. So this is uh, an idea of just how all these different memories and representations can be used in order to perform a task. So SOAR has been used in lots of different tasks. Here are some of the example virtual environments SOAR has been used in, uh, where SOAR is often used as a synthetic ent entity that's controlling something in an environment. So for example, we, we had a um, little game that we created called Haunt where SOAR controlled a ghost. We've done some military applications where SOAR controls vehicles. We've also done games where SOAR controls individual characters like in StarCraft or in action games like Mario. And we even have a uh, app that runs on iPhones that you can play against. It's that called Buyer's Dice where it is a opponent for you that you play against. So these are all different kinds of things that have been implemented in SOAR. Um, we also have environments from SOAR Technology, a company that uses SOAR for many of its applications. And these often are also where there's a synthetic entity, or in this case, down here, a robot that SOAR is controlling. Um, SOAR has also been used in lots of different robotic platforms over the years. Here's many of them up until about five years ago. Um, they include uh, mobile robots, they include um, hands, um, a lot of mobile robots. They also include underwater vehicles 
and also sort of some toy robots. We hooked Sora up to Mindstorms uh, for fun. And uh, here is what we've done recently at Michigan in the last couple of years. So we've hooked Sora up to a bunch of different simulators, a homegrown simulator that we use to do a lot of different games. Um, there's the April Arm Simulator, which is developed by the April Lab at Michigan um, and lets us do uh, hand, um, eye, and gripper type uh, manipulation of blocks. We also have the April uh, Magic Simulator, which lets us create uh, indoor uh, scenes and outdoor scenes as well. And here we have an agent that goes around and uh, picks up objects and does a um, uh, century, uh, I'm sorry, a um, what's called a patrol task. And this is hooked up to AI to Thor, which lets us do reasoning in a indoor environment. But we've also done tabletop robots. This is a robot arm created by Edwin Olson's April Lab that we've used to do a lot of different games. Um, this is the fetch robot, which also does the same thing. And then this is the magic robot for outdoor. And we even hooked up SOAR to the little Cosmo robot. Um, so one of the things that's really important to us is being able to hook up the architecture to lots of different environments and lots of different tasks. And the code, it turns out, that runs here is exactly the same code that runs here. The only difference is in what is the interface um, to the vision system and to the mobile robot controller. All right. So one of the things we've been looking at recently is what we call interactive task learning. This is where you're teaching an AI agent completely new tasks using natural language. The idea is that there's a lot of systems out there that know how to do a task or learn to do a single task, but they're completely unable to apply that knowledge to a new task. And so what we want to look at is how do you teach a system a completely new task from scratch given uh, just natural language. And they do learn all aspects of the task. We're really emphasizing natural language and shared context. So it's like the systems of an apprentice where you're teaching it as you're showing it how to do the task. What we want to do is have this natural, which means it has to be real time online with one shot learning, and it reuses knowledge learned from previous instruction. So this is a system called ROSI. Um, we've implemented in SOAR. We've encoded knowledge that implements the language comprehension and this learning strategy and how we do interaction. Um, we have it learn office tasks, um, like in the simulator I showed earlier about doing patrol tasks. We've also taught it 60 different games and puzzles, and it runs on four, those four different robot platforms you saw. It runs on Cosmo, it runs on the, this mobile robot, and it runs in different simulators. So here is it um, after we've instructed it from scratch um, on Towers of Hanoi, and here it's solving Towers of Hanoi. But we really started out with it just knowing how to pick up blocks, also knowing um, what different kinds of, uh, that there's things like color, size, and shape. And so, and then being able to give instructions on the rules of tic-tac-toe. And the same system can be taught to play I'm sorry, Towers of Hanoi can be taught to play tic-tac-toe and about 55 other games. Here we're teaching um, the using the same software uh, task um, in order to fetch, I'm sorry, in order to d deliver an object. And so here the human is giving instructions like it is, and the system asks, how do I um, do certain things? And so it's an interactive uh, learning type of thing where the system asks questions and then the human provides answers. And here's the system doing the games again, but in this case, we're using the fetch robot instead of this robot arm. So uh, let me switch more to the fact that we're building a software system and a common open software system. So there's two implementations of SOAR. The one we maintain at Michigan is implemented in C and C++, and it runs on Windows, Linux, OS X, iOS X, and ARM. Um, it interfaces for it has interfaces for C++, Python, and Java. We have something called SML, the SOAR markup language that supports this. This is the cutting edge research implementation. It's the one that all my students use, and it has the, all the new learning algorithms and all the um, most powerful uh, semantic memory module. 
It also is um, the most efficient implementation and it's open source, free and maintained by the University of Michigan. There's also a system, we use, this is when we say SOAR, we usually mean the CSOAR version. There's also Java SOAR or JSOAR, which is implemented in Java. It is uh, supposed to be exactly the same as CSOAR. Unfortunately, because of resources, um, we're not able to keep it up with this, the version of, of CSOAR. So it's in version 9.3. Um, it has better graphical debugger and scripting capabilities because it's implemented in Java. And the idea is that it possibly has better multi-language support, better multi-threading, and in a cleaner integration with Java Enterprise System. It's also open source, it's also free, and it's maintained by SOAR technology. So here are some of the example users we have um, use over the years. We have a lot of different academic users. The main one is the University of Michigan, but it is used in Georgia Tech um, University of Portland and a lot of other universities. Sometimes this will be only a single professor at a given university, although there was a bigger effort at Penn State, and sometimes they will use it for a while and then not use it because they're doing other things. So there was a may, um, some years ago, it was used extensively at the University of Southern California and the Institute for Creative Technology, but it's also been used worldwide in Israel, Brazil, and Korea. There's also companies that use it. SOAR Technology uses it for intelligent training and autonomous vehicles. They do a lot of other AI techniques, but they, this is one of the systems they use. Um, PARC, which is used to be Xerox PARC, is using it for cognitive systems research and development with applications of interactive task learning to healthcare. Optum, which is a technology company associated with United Health, um, is you is starting to use it for healthcare applications, and then there's a few other companies um, actively using it. So what's our experience with open source? Um, the positive is I think it greatly expands the people who are using SOAR, both academic and commercial. I think there are definitely academic people that if they had to pay for it, would not be used. And that's also true at the commercial side. Many years ago, open source was um, not looked on well in the commercial schemes, but, but it is now. Um, it also allows my students to easily take their work with them and continue. Uh, the park work is being done by Shivali Mohan, who was a student here and has had take some of her work and is now working using it at park. It also leads to unexpected contacts and usage. It's just being out there that people can download. Sometimes we only find out that people are using SOAR um, when Google Scholar shows up as a, that they have a reference to our work. So that's kind of cool. Um, I wish we had more uh, contact with them, but it just shows that we've been able to package SOAR in a way that people can just download it and start using it on their own. The negatives are the obvious maintenance and release issues. Um, we do extensive testing before release, but it is very time consuming. The good thing is the University of Michigan students are probably the heaviest, most aggressive users of SOAR. So we usually find all the bugs ourselves and we've had good experience the last couple of releases where when, we, when it goes out, we don't have to fix bugs and things like that. But we have significant resources that have to go into this. Um, supporting all the different um, operating systems is painful. Um, making sure that we have the right versions of Java and Unix and all that is, is just painful. Um, there have been few architectural extensions from outside of U of M or SORTEC, which has been a dis little bit disappointing, but there have been some. The challenges um, of doing this open source is cognitive architectures are extremely complex. Um, it's very difficult for people outside of a place like Michigan or SORTEC to use them um, because it's a novel computational framework. It's very difficult for them to also learn to modify, to change the underlying C++ or Java code because it's complex. Um, and it also sometimes requires, you know, whenever we hook up to a new robot, we have to develop an interface. Now we build off our existing interfaces and sometimes we can use the fact that we have interfaces to ROS and we can have support for Python and Java, but it still is work to do. So to connect up to the Cosmo, took some work. You have to write the uh, interface for input and output. The other big, big thing is this is student research code. These are graduate students that are developing the code. It's often not well documented. There's often different styles of how to code. 
there's um, the it's the expertise for the code is really in the students who develop it and that can be lost when they leave the good news is i have good relationships with my students so um they don't dis they uh will often come back or at least you know help us with it we also don't have a lot of resources for the maintain maintenance and rewriting code and this could all be a barrier for commercial use is the fact that uh, the code is research code so i could imagine that if somebody really wanted to use it in a, in a, a critical application that they would um, need to rewrite some of the code um, in order to do that. Uh, one of the things we do that I think helps um, with getting it out there is we do have a yearly workshop and a tutorial. Um, we traditionally have 20 to 25 people attend the tutorial over two days, and we have a wide range of pe people from academics and from companies. We also have a workshop that is about 60 to 70 people. That's over two days usually. This year was only a year because of being um, virtual. Um, with a lot of the presentations be from UM students, former UM students, and people from SORTEC. But this is a way to get up more people into the uh, into using it. So in terms of recommendations. Uh, in order to do something like this, you really need a full-time research support. We have half-time right now, but over the years, we've been had between half-time and full-time. I can't imagine we would have been able to do this without it. We really need to have extensive regression testing and automated build procedures for all the platforms to make it possible to do these releases. I uh, would really be good if we had documentation on all aspects of the system. We don't have great documentation. We do have tutorials for using SOAR, but not on how to say make changes to the episodic memory system uh, we have pretty good tutorials and manuals and the fact that we have a SOAR book i think makes things a little a good good thing and i think that's really critical i think it's really important to have systems that people can download and maybe that's something we need to do more of we have some example code but it would be good to have more and you do need to have a general approach to interfacing to other systems whether it's through ROS, which only provides some things. Um, we have our own that also hooks to ROS, and that has helped a lot. So that's sort of uh, my talk. Um, I hope we can have a discussion about this. I look forward to the rest of the